maybe just maybe this is a moment for us to call for enormous change instead of incremental change. And um, a lot of us have spent our time like really working the margins on incremental change. And I would include our attitude towards data around that. And um, just hearing Adrian and, and really reaching into this, um, what if uh, we embarked on a mission of uh, data liberation? And what that could mean is that we are not the arbiters, the namers, or the describers of data at all anymore. And that um, the data, that four-letter word is no longer a four-letter word because it talks about stories and lived experiences and um, the perspectives that reach generations, as was mentioned. I just, what if for every answer that we're talking about today, we talk about it in the context that Adnan was mentioning about, this is our one chance in maybe a 50 or a 100 or some years to really say everything we talk about has to be huge. We have to, as huge as my hands look on this screen right now, like we have to, we have to be thinking about transformational rethinking um, so that even when you asked that question, Hillary, like um, it felt like you were centering um, traditional places that consider themselves the knowledge centers, naming a process. And like, what if we blew every idea up and, and reframed and re even asked the questions differently? Um, what, I wonder what that would look like. I know that when, if you want me to get to the vaccine piece, um, um, it is it is so common for us to make this mistake in the systems that I am guilty of being a part of, where we get to the last moment and then suddenly we want to have a meaningful conversation with a community about something when we should have had those conversations for generations now. We should have been uh, having these talks, these conversations in ways that would not make us have to ask this question, how do we do this right now in this moment in the next five minutes to make sure we make the best decision um, that in a system that is already so, man, I'm really trying not to swear, but it's like so, um, so built to be dysfunctional and harmful, harmful, like killing people harmful. Um, I just, I want to rethink these questions a little bit and think about um, what is the situation where this is done in a, in a much more honest, uh, respectful, and, and dignifying manner. So what is, what is a dignifying way to think about getting vaccines to people? I would love, I don't, I'm actually interested in, in Adnan's and Adrian's perspective on that. Sorry for that weird yeah. response. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that that's, that, that's a great um, way to think about it, Ben. And, and I, I think that that's, that's the challenge, right? Um, I, I will say this, um, in, in the assessing so far the two first clinical trials that are out right now, um, one of the things that is so frustrating for me is that of all the people that have signed up to participate in these clinical trials, people of color make up only about 20% of those that have signed up so far. Um, and they, and, and, and the pharmaceuticals who are doing the clinical trials don't seem to understand that that's not, ha that's not happening by chance. There, is, there are people out there who have this total distrust and yet the pharmaceuticals, and if you're trying to push something out so quickly um, so that it, it, you know, someone's going to be the first to do this and make all this money or, you know, you have a president that this is going to be, he's going to be reelected on this. Um, without truly understanding these communities, um, we're going to fall short again, and then we're going to try, you know, we'll, we'll blame the communities. Well, they didn't want to participate. We made it available, but they didn't, you know, uh, sign up for this. I think we have to be intentional about going out into the communities and talking to them and having them really put together, you know, the, the process on how to do this, right? Um, the pharmaceuticals still, the, the two that, that we have reviewed so far, um, are collecting investments and are not telling, based off of the informed consent, are not telling the individuals that those specimens 
can potentially be used for other research projects. We haven't learned our lesson and we continue to do that. Um, and so I, I think Ben, it's, 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 it's about people in our, I guess, positions, our, our ability to, to talk on that, on that behalf and put our feet down and say, no, you're not going to do this. You can't do this, you know? Um, and this is why it's important to understand that this has to be done in a certain way that honors the pe the these populations, their culture, them as individuals, and not treat them as a number, um, you know, for for scientific research. I'll just piggyback really quick after uh, Dr. Daniels and what he has to say, like. Now, how to have a dignified approach. I mean, when a pharmaceutical company is one of the leading industries and the leading lobbyist in a, in a political year, how are you going to build that trust? I mean, I, mean, I, I just don't think it's possible. I don't think it's possible. And, and, and of course, CMAR is going to try and we're going to be like, like try to be the, the link between the community, but people aren't naive. Um, these aren't sheep. And so, and who's going to sign up? I wouldn't sign up <laughs> for a new vaccine and, and the history of, of, of what that entails. And so like, unless there's money, unless there's something like meat involved, I, I, I just, I agree with Dr. Danis. And it's like, you, I think it was Carl Taylor, who's a public health giant that said like, if you want to do anything meaningful, play with the kids for six months, then, then go to your next step. We don't have time, but if you haven't done that step, then it's going to be really hard to go forward.